One of the Thai idioms for meditating is making an effort. And the effort is precisely in being very careful about your intentions. Because actually an effort goes into all of our experience in the present moment. Excuse me. We're always shaping our experience by our intentions. And there's quite a lot of effort right there to begin with. And what we're doing in the effort of the meditation is to be more careful about our intentions, more careful about how we're shaping things. One of the most radical discoveries in meditation is exactly how much you are already doing. We tend to have an attitude that we're, we're like people watching TV, totally passive. Everything is already taken care of. It's simply our duty to watch. The present moment then is something that's already ready-made, and is, we're simply consumers, watchers, spectators. But that's not the case. We're shaping things from the very beginning, both through our past actions and our present actions, what we're doing right now. We take the materials coming in from the past and we shape them into the present. So we already are making an effort. We already are doing something. And we want to do that as skillfully as possible. Because the way we shape the present moment affects not only the present moment, but it has ramifications that go on into the future. So you want to be very mindful about where you're being skillful and where you're not. When the Buddha gave his first instructions to his son, who at the time was only seven years old, it came down to the issue of being very careful about your intentions, looking at your intentions before you act, looking at the results of your actions while you're doing it. If you notice anything unskillful, stop. If not, continue. And then look at the results of your actions after they're done. And if you've caused harm in ways that you hadn't expected, Talk it over with other people who are practicing, and then resolve not to repeat that mistake. This willingness to admit our own mistakes and to change our ways. This is a very important part of the practice. If we can't change our ways, we, there's no purpose in practicing at all. This is why the Buddha said that there's one requirement for someone to practice the Dharma with him is someone who is honest and open. In other words, you admit your mistakes. readily, because it's only that way that you're going to learn, both from other people that you talk to about your mistakes and from just watching cause and effect in your own actions. We may think that this teaching is simply about external actions, but also refers to the, what we're doing in the mind. The way you're focusing on the breath right now has an impact on how you're experiencing the breath. Your concepts about the breath, your concepts about what it means to be focused your intention and in being with the breath. All of these things shape the breath, shape your experience of the breath. And you want to get sensitive so you can notice when you've made a mistake, so that you can correct it as quickly as possible. Because otherwise the effort we put into the present moment just becomes more and more and more of a burden if we're not careful. So what we're trying to do is lighten our burdens. That's why the meditation is called practice. You read books on practicing swimming, say, or practicing a musical instrument. And when they describe the process, what it means to practice these things in an effective way, it's always looking for how you're doing things in an inefficient way, expending more energy than you really have to, getting less results than you should. So we learn to let go of as much misunderstanding, as much inefficiency, as much lack of mindfulness as you can. That's why we say we practice. Many times our problem is that we tend to carry things around from the past. Psychologists say that the sense of self is strongest about around things where we thought we've been wronged in the past.
and we tend to hold on to those stories more tightly than perhaps anything else in our experience. It places a huge weight on us the more we carry this baggage around, the less good we can do in the present moment. We don't have the energy. In Pali they have the word upati, which can be translated as belongings, paraphernalia. The original image is of nomadic tribes, all their stuff that they would carry around, that was their upati. their tents, their belongings. And for a nomadic tribe, of course, you want to keep those things as light as possible, take only what is really necessary. You see this principle reflected in the life of the monks. Monks are supposed to keep their possessions to a minimum. The ideal monk described in the canon is someone who carries only the, the amount of number of robes, his begging bowl just what's necessary for our survival, and everything else he leaves behind. He says, like a bird that takes its wings as its only burden. In other words, the things that allow it to move, that's its burden. It, doesn't, it tries to keep everything else trimmed away. And it's a principle not only in terms of physical things, material things, but also in terms of your mind. Look at all the baggage you carry around. Try to eliminate as much as possible stuff you've dragged in from the past. There are lessons to be learned from the past, but many times we carry a lot of unnecessary stuff around. So do your best to let go of that old baggage, so you can give more energy to the present moment, to shape the present moment, and through the present moment you shape the future in a way that's really skillful, it causes less and less suffering for yourself, less and less suffering for the people around you. Always mindful of the fact that the way you experience the present moment is a doing. There's an effort that goes into it. It's a skill that can be developed. It starts with the very basics of how we approach our experience, the way we breathe, the way we approach our breath, the way we approach everything. We're not here just to practice the, but the breath. We take the breath as a foundation, but we also are practicing other aspects of what's good in our lives. I was recently translating a talk by John Lee. He refers over and over again to people who come to the monastery, he says, to develop their goodness, to build their goodness. And that includes not only your goodness as you meditate, but your goodness in everything you do. If you're eager to develop your goodness, you find more and more opportunities to do it. If you're grudging, then it just, you're just placing limitations on yourself. So the goodness is not just in the meditation. It's in everything. You take the meditation, you take the breath as your basis for the way you approach everything, because it gives you the strength that's needed in order to do that goodness in other areas as well. But it's not just the meditation. Everything we do while we're here should be devoted to developing goodness in all areas, because we're training the whole mind, so that our effort into shaping the present, no matter what the present is, whether we're sitting here with our eyes closed or working around the monastery, doing chores, helping in various ways, it's all of a piece. Because the way you approach the meditation should connect with the way you approach other aspects of life, and the way you approach other aspects of life is going to have an impact on your meditation. So try to keep it all as seamless as possible. After all, it is the same mind. No matter what the situation, you want to develop the same qualities all throughout the day. So the effort you place into put into shaping your life here is consistently as skillful as possible. And it's in developing the skill that you gain a lot of insight, unexpected insights. Insights don't only come when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. They come in unexpected times of the day. So you want to be attentive to what you're doing. 
And the more you focus on being skillful in what you do, the more likely the insights are to come. The insights that lighten your load, lighten the load of the people around you. And ultimately, you can get to that point where you can see what it's like not to have an intention in the present moment, when everything reaches a point of equilibrium and, other, and another dimension opens up. That's where this is all aimed. So think of your whole life, everything you do, as aiming in that direction. Then, as John Lee Fuyang said in his talk the other night, our life isn't divided up into times. The time to do this, the time to go into town, the time to work on this, the time to sit and meditate. If it's all chopped up like that, then it doesn't gain any momentum. But if it's timeless, the, the pursuit of skill in how you shape the present moment, then it all comes together. <laughs>